Do we need a geek style approach to chronic care management? Today's guest, CCS CEO Tony Vahidian, says yes. CCS is enabling chronic care extension teams that leverage data insights, personalized clinical guidance, and coaching to support behavior change. Hi, everyone. I'm David Williams, president of strategy consulting firm Health Business Group and host of the Health Biz Podcast, a weekly show where I interview top healthcare leaders about their lives and careers. Please leave a comment, subscribe, or rate the show. Tony, welcome to the Health Biz Podcast. David, thank you. Thanks for thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. You know, I love geek squads, so I'm happy to be uh, happy to be talking about those. But before we get into that, I want to hear a little bit about your uh, your upbringing, your your background. You know, anything from your childhood that is uh, stuck with you? Yeah, you know, I, I think my upbringing is quite dynamic. I, I grew up in the I was born in the Midwest, moved to the Middle East uh, for a few years, moved back to the Midwest. Um, and then finally ended up my formative years on the East Coast. So I think, you know, the influences early in my or early in my life were about um, adapting uh, w- when you move um, and really appreciating the culture and communities that you're a part of. And I think uh, that's when I look back at it, that was a big deal. Right. I mean, very different cultural experiences, very different pace from the Midwest to the East Coast. And um, ending up on the East Coast has kind of uh, been great for me as well. And, you know, now I'm back in Columbus, Ohio. So I'm kind of in between now. So I think those were my early days that have influenced me to this day. Sounds good. You know, I think in Midwest, I think of like Kansas City, Mideast, I think that's like, uh, you know, Philadelphia or something, right? Is that? Uh... <laughs> so so it, it's Jefferson City, Missouri, and then the Washington, D.C. metro area. So okay. I hit that, it. That, that the I hit it pretty well. I actually grew up in Bethesda, which was kind of a cool place because yeah. uh, there are people from all over the world uh, all that the were world. there at the time. So that was good. Absolutely. And then what did you do, Tony, in terms of education after high school? So I, uh, I went to school for undergrad back on the East Coast, went to James Madison University uh, down in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Uh, and then I did my, I uh, went to graduate school at the Fisher College of Business at uh, the Ohio State University. So back in Columbus. So that's kind of my educational background, which is also East Coast and, and, and Midwest. So yeah, uh, that's how I ended up. So, uh, and then early on in your career, I was like career. I like to look at what people put on their LinkedIn profile. And I say that you saw that you work at Scott's, uh, miracle grow. So that's, I guess, a growth company, uh, yeah. to begin with, what was that experience like? So, you know, I, I, early in my career, I was a finance guy. I, I studied finance, came out, did some finance things in, in the DC area and, um, foreign exchange investment firms. And, you know, I got, uh, recruited by a woman that I worked for to come out and work for this company called Scott's Miracle Grow in Marysville, Ohio, which is right outside of Columbus, because they were levering up and doing a bunch of acquisitions. So I was 20 something and said, all right, let's go for it. So I went over to Scott's. We levered up, made a series of acquisitions all over the globe, uh, which was a great experience from a finance perspective, but then kind of pivoted, did strategy work at, at, uh, at Scott's and established the first strategic planning group there. Uh, but then I actually got to run some global businesses, which was a lot of fun. So uh, I ran a grass seed business and a bird food business. So if you ever want to talk grass seed or bird food, we can talk about that too. But that was my consumer product experience that I think uh, also stayed with me uh, to this day. Because I think uh, what I learned is that consumer um, will ultimately tell you the answer, whether you like it or not. So I think that was a early, early learning for me. Uh, for my Scott's Miracle Grow days. Yeah, it is interesting because in the healthcare field, you talk about like being consumer centric and and patient centric and that kind of thing. And it's a kind of a head scratcher for people who come to those fields. Like if you told somebody at Scott's, hey, you have to care what the consumer thinks. It's like, yeah, that's a great insight. You know, no kidding. That's who buys it. But somehow when we come to healthcare, because the third party reimbursement, I think mostly and just sort of the nature of the profession of medicine, it doesn't happen like that. My my Scott's Miracle Grow story is that uh, when I moved into an apartment in, in Boston uh, years ago, there was a guy who lived downstairs as the superintendent of the building and was um, from Brazil. And he saw like our house plants that were doing that well. He says, you got to get Miracle Grow. And I'm thinking, uh-huh. what? what the heck is, what is he talking about? And I saw the little green thing at one point. So that's like, ah, okay, Miracle Grow. Yeah, you know, it's amazing how those brands do. Uh, uh, I mean, once they make the connection, it's very real. But I will tell you one of the things we, I mean, the, the best example from consumer product is you, you develop a product, you sit on the one way mirror and you see the consumer looking at your product and tell, giving you the truth, whether you like it or not, if it's good or bad. And, and I think that's really critical. And something like a miracle grow, 
it was a global brand. People understand it and, and it connects um, and it works too, which is the most important part when you're buying when you're buying something. Yeah, that's good. All right. So let's talk about Cardinal Health, which I'm sure, well, I'm not going to say I'm sure, but it, it doesn't sound quite as much fun, but maybe you had a good time there as well. And it looks like you did a variety of things there, probably building on you know what you've done. Look like some general management experience. I know it sounds like Navi Health was acquired by Cardinal right. and then you were running a, a country. So what was that whole uh, whole thing like? You know, David, what was interesting, it was this thing called LinkedIn had just started, right? So I put my information on there and somebody called me. Um, so I made the switch from consumer products over to healthcare. Um, and I came into Cardinal Health, you know, Fortune 50 company at that time, even probably bigger than that. Um, and I came in as a general manager to run one of their service businesses. But I was probably the first one with consumer product or finance background to come in. Uh, but it was really an incredible experience. So I, I had a business called OptiFreight. Uh, we were able to do some acquisitions into that business, uh, then bought a company called Wavemark that was around RFID and, and, and service management, ran all of services for, for Cardinal's medical segment, had an opportunity to go down to Nashville when we acquired a company called Nava Health. I was chief product and chief marketing officer down there, and that was an incredible ride, and that's where I got my first uh, you know taste of risk-based or value-based care type of contracting, which was really, really interesting, um, kind of when Cardinal decided to spin that business back out, I came back to Columbus and we had bought a division of Medtronic. So I ran a couple of global product units there. And then uh, from there, I had an opportunity to go run Cardinal Health Canada, which I jumped at because it was kind of a mini version of Cardinal Health US, which was a great experience. And then this thing, COVID hit us all. Um, yeah. So I, I couldn't travel to Canada. And uh, for some reason in there, decided to ch uh, change uh, jobs and found CCS. So that's kind of been my journey at, at Cardinal and how I got over to CCS. That sounds interesting. You know, when um, when I saw the pitch for CCS Medical and I'm talking about the Geek Squad, I'm thinking, well, that doesn't sound like what CCS has been known for historically. So it sounds, I'm also getting the sense that you kind of shake things up when you go, maybe you brought a little little uh, packet of miracle Grow over to, uh, you know, as you go from division to division and now co company to company. But what, what's the historical business of CCS Medical, just to, just to ground the listeners? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of folks, um, depending on where you sit in, in this ecosystem of healthcare, probably have heard CCS. It's 25 years. Uh, it's been around for 25 years. Uh, it really focused early on in its, uh, in its infancy around delivering products to home, pretty much focused on chronic care. Um, it's had some ups and downs. Um, but right now, uh, what we're focused on is really diabetes at home. And, you know, when I came over, one of the things I looked at is, kind of what are we participating in? And, and the two big macro trends that we participate in is home care, so care going to the home, and diabetes. Um, it's a disease state that's growing rapidly and a lot of innovation coming in. So there was just some very good macro trends going in at it. And the bones of the business, because it's been around for so long, were pretty good. Um, you know, we had a solid distribution business that we needed to, you know, probably make some investments in. And we were actually doing some care management already too. But uh, so I feel good about that, but that's the history of it. And that's kind of the state it was in when I, when I joined. And people talk about, yeah, you know, I think about CCS as a DME company to some extent. And, you know, DME is always kind of a confusing concept. I mean, what, what is it? Cause I think the D stands for durable, but also I think there's some disposable things that come under DME too. So I, I've always, it's a little bit of a head scratcher. So DME is durable med medical equipment. So that, that's what it stands for. So um, and, and I think historically, they've been known for more like pick, pack and ship, you know, get a product, ship it out the door and get it over there efficiently, which is what we do. Right. And on one side of the business. But I think from my perspective, and this probably goes back to my consumer product days, is um, I actually have found and one of the areas that we focus on is the relationships that we have with these patients are remarkable. Right. So we talk to these patients 10 to 15 times a year. Uh, the average tenure is probably three to four years, depending on when they've joined us. Um, and we know a lot about them. So we know everything about their insurance, their HCPs. We know everything about their condition. We have their uh, medical records. So we have these really valuable, intimate relationships with these patients that um, I think we had historically under leveraged. And, and there's a lot more that we can do with them. And frankly, there's a lot more that they need. So um, I think historically DMEs are known about pick, pack and ship and get it out the door. Um, and I think um, we do that, but I think the more valuable piece is about these relationships that we have with these patients. Got it. So, you know, when you talk about long-term relationships, of course, in, in healthcare, instead of saying like, you know, long-term relationships, you call it chronic, 
you know, it's a, you have a chronic relationship with the customer. Right. But in any case, chronic chronic disease. So as you mentioned, you had the insights into you've got uh, you know, chronic hair is a big issue, right. uh, diabetes in particular. You've got the at home uh, connections, and it's 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 really a growing field. What do you see as some of the main issues in chronic care? I mean, people have diabetes, they have other chronic conditions. What are the kind of the big issues for someone coming into the space and wanting to focus on it? You know, one of the things that I learned uh, about this, this whole chronic condition management is we, we kind of focus back on the patient and said, hey, what does a journey look like for somebody when they're getting diagnosed, right? And, and imagine you're walking in, you're all of a sudden you're going to be diagnosed with diabetes. The physician is saying, okay, you're, you're a diabetic uh, based on your lab, based on diagnosis. Here's some information. And, you know, by the way, we're going to put you on a CGM. You leave the doctor's office, right? First of all, you're a little bit probably put it back on, oh, wait a second, I just got, uh, you know, a diagnosis that I have to deal with. Plus, they just learned another uh, TLA three-letter acronym, CGM. You want to say what that is? Continuous glucose monitoring. So a concluded, continuous glucose monitoring device. Those are devices that uh, diabetics have put on them. They are sensors that then read into either another reader or into your phone. So, um, and they're used to make sure they can monitor blood sugar levels. So that's one of the most common things that, when you get diagnosed with diabetes, they put you on. Um, so, so the patient gets uh, diagnosed on the drive home. They're probably a little bit nervous. They get home. Um, they're reading the piece of paper. Maybe they're Googling. They're calling a friend. Um, and right after, right around that period, uh, they're probably getting a follow-up from their HCP. Uh, their payer is probably sending uh, an email. Yeah, and um, H H HCP being healthcare professional. Healthcare professionals, sorry, you're going to have to keep me honest I, on those. Yeah. Healthcare professionals, the payers are uh, also paying them, trying to help. And the manufacturers many times are understanding. So uh, understanding that they have this diagnosis or connecting with them. So all of a sudden, there's this plethora of data or outreaches that are happening. And nobody's coordinating or integrating that event. And many times these patients are left to, you know, create their own journey, which is very difficult and intimidating, especially when that box shows up with the CGM that, that you open up and you realize, well, wait a second, I got to put something on me and then I got to sync everything up. So we saw that fragmentation as one of the biggest um, gaps, if you will, in, in chronic care management. Um, and nobody was able to coordinate it in an effective way and frankly, may not have the right incentives to coordinate it uh, effectively. So with that as the cornerstone kind of observation, that kind of helped us set our journey over the last three years on, on the pieces we needed to put together. Makes sense. I mean, if you're if you're thinking about what it means for a, you know, in contrast to like my house plan, it wasn't growing, you know, worst case it dies or I buy another one. You find out you've got diabetes and all of a sudden, you, you know, your life is going to change your whole, you know, you got to change what you're eating, your exercise, you've got these different devices and all that. And I think what the health plans and the providers, healthcare professionals realize is that, hey, a lot of times there's a lot of failure at the start. You know, you have the yeah. diagnosis and it just because just somebody has a serious thing doesn't mean they're actually going to do something about it. So all of them want to follow up, but then you're getting bombarded as the patient with messages that aren't coordinated and so on. So I think that's a, that's a good insight. Um, and I guess the question is then how, how do you go from that insight to having a business that makes sense for CCS given your starting point? Yeah, so so the way we've looked at it is, you know, at the point of referral, let's let's say that which is essentially the same point of diagnosis, our business essentially engages, right? So we have a field team that's engaged with the healthcare providers out there, um, and at that point of referral, we're able to take that referral, um, connect with the patient, and say, look, we have a referral for you for to go on a continuous glucose monitoring device. And from that referral, we can adjudicate the claim, we can uh, and send out the device. As a part of the sending out the device, we have onboarding programs that we put in place. So the device lands there with the patient. We call them, say, hey, let's open up the box. Let's see, um, let's see what's in the box. Let's tell you about the box. Let's see uh, what's the device. Let's tell you how to put it on and how to use it. Um, and then we have the ability, and we've had the ability to then follow up and do coaching which is not only about the device, it's really about lifestyle coaching that, that goes on. And we also have the ability to do remote patient monitoring so we can monitor that patient and make sure if they have readings that are out of range, connect with them, and if needed, escalate. 
Um, and then we also had an RX business that um, could also provide the RX uh, that, that, that many of these patients are on as well. And we do have some other distributed products such as wound care, ostomy, and other things that really allow us to wrap around everything that patient needs. Um, and then the analytics to identify patients are going to go off of service so we can keep them on service. So those are the components or the platform that we thought we needed to develop. And that's kind of the path we set because that would be the integrated solution, right? Patient gets referred and it's one relationship that manages in its entirety um, and can really deal with all the questions and breakage that happens. And this is kind of when the geek squad came in. To yeah. be uh, because think about it. I don't know about you. Every once in a while I get a device, you're like, all right, I can figure this out. And, you know, whether it's a phone or a TV yeah. or a laptop, you're like, all right, I'll figure it out. And you know, sometimes you got to call the geek squad or they have to actually come into the home. And we believe that that's kind of what happens to a patient whenever they receive a device that they got to open up and figure out how to use. Like if somebody's not there, and I think there's varying stats on this, a lot of times they open it up and say, nope, no, thank you. Put it yeah. lid back on and throw it in the, throw it in the closet. And, that's not good. And even if they do put it on the first time, they got to stay on it, right? So right. they got and breaks along the way. So that's how Geek Squad came into our vernacular. Got it. Because I think that's part of what 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 goes on here and what we need to provide uh, for to to bring the fragmented experience together. So I want to back up a little bit to sure. something you said about Navi Health, which was that you know that's where you started to learn about uh, both the home care element, but also value-based care, risk-based. And sure. and you mentioned, uh, as it relates to the chronic care patient now, that there's a lot of interested parties that they don't necessarily have the right sort of incentives, the right sort of alignment there to, to be help the patient. Now, value-based care is becoming more uh, common, especially among Medicare Advantage, but beyond that as well. And how does that emergence of value-based care, how does that affect what you're doing? Does that make it easier for you to have a, a role? Does that align things better? You know, I, I think there's one big distinction, David, that I see with value-based care. A lot of the value-based care initiatives have historically been around episodic care, right? So a surgical event, uh, that the surgery and 90-day post post uh, surgery and readmissions, and so those are those are kind of episodic in nature and usually are um, happening within a single payer and year, if you will, right? So it's all it's all contained. I think chronic care is very, very different because it extends um, and it do doesn't have an episode. It's, it's ongoing. Uh, so it makes it a little bit more complicated to put value-based care. These, these individuals also likely move between payers within that chronic care period um, and usually come with a lot more comorbidities to manage. So I think, I think the incentives are actually difficult to align because of those dynamics in value-based care. But we believe the only way you can actually manage those patients is to have that integrated platform that allows you to deal with, with the device, with the coaching, with the monitoring, with the RX and the analytics to more effectively manage that patient. And frankly, we can do it from payer to payer, but as you know, is not everybody has everybody payers contracts. So um, I think value-based care is, is, is the right way for healthcare to go, but I think it needs to figure out how to adjust itself uh, based on episodic versus chronic. And I think that we're still a little bit on that journey. Got it. So like at Navi Health, you have the situation where someone's uh, having pretty well-defined surgical procedure that's then yep. going to be followed by post-acute. And it's sort of yep. getting them out of the hospital into the sn sniff. Oh, that's my fault. I yep. used a, uh, a three-letter yeah. acronym there, you know, skilled nursing facility. Uh, and then onto the, you know, onto the home, which is going to be less expensive usually uh, over time. And then you can measure the readmission. So that's one thing, great, 90 days, a lot of expense yeah. there. But if chronic care is our main issue, you know, we got to look at the diabetic beyond 90 days. Exactly. And, and you know, I think you have diabetics, you have CPAP, you have some uh, cardiac conditions that are, that are now being treated with a device and being monitored and um, have RX in there. I, I think there's a lot of these chronic conditions. And listen, if you don't manage them, they become very, very high consuming, right? So I think uh, managing them longer term, more effectively on an integrated platform is really the ultimate goal, but it goes back to, to what you had mentioned is the incentives on each vertical of the, the ecosystem that's involved and the skills that each eco, uh, each player has is very different. The payers hold the funding, but may not be fully enabled on delivering care or delivering products. Uh, the HCPs, they're fully burnt out. So for them to coordinate further care, I mean, that's asking a lot. Yeah. The manufacturers are focused on device innovation which is kind of where we want them, not connecting the ecosystem. 
And I, I think where we sit, we deal with all of them, including the patient. So I think we're well positioned to put the pieces together as well. So let's zero in a little bit on the kind of device in the home perspective. You mentioned, I think, also that uh, I think what you said you'd, you'd acquired some Medtronic, uh, compo- some Medtronic businesses before. So I have a colleague that used to work for Medtronic, and he was involved in some of the first remote monitoring they'd done on the implantable cardiac devices. And they would monitor, you know, at home. It's some basic stuff that they would they would do, some basic right. telemetry. Um, and actually, they the manufacturer did that because they wanted otherwise the uh, the offices that were doing the implants actually ran out of capacity. So the manufacturer right. took this took this piece on. But they found that going from one button to two buttons uh, reduced the ability of the patient to use it dramatically. And right. you know, this was before the iPhone and things like that that made things simpler. But you know, the devices are not so straightforward. And sometimes the same people that are having the device, you know, if you have advanced diabetes, your also your eyesight might not be that good. You might not be that dexterous. It might be other you know, kind of right. issues that are, that are out there. And so what is the, if I compare like a, you know, geek squad, and I want you to get in trouble with the people that invented that, but if I compare that with sort of, you know, someone to come in cause my TV, you know, I'm having trouble getting two football games at a time versus what you do kind of on the, on the device side or what needs to be done for a chronic care patient. How, how do I, how do I contrast those? You know, I think it's, it's a, it's a great question. And there is, there's a big contrast, right? So many of the, many times in, we just did a video shoot with with one of our CDCs, so a diabetes uh, education consultants, and one of the patients. And one of the things that happens there's this level of trust that an individual that has a device that's not working or can't figure it out has with a clinician who understands the condition and the device. Right. So it's not just about the device; it's about the human condition as well. So whenever that happens. Um, you know, we don't send anybody into the home. We yeah. we call them or we go to the video uh, conference and we kind of help them through what's going on with the device or what's going on with them personally. So the intimacy or the importance of the human connection, I think, is still very, very valid in healthcare, right? Um, Geek, Squad, Geek Squad will come in and put the TV up or maybe yeah. come in and turn it. Uh, but I think there's a different level of intimacy with healthcare that you have to understand what's going on with that patient, both just from a human condition, but clinically as well, to then connect the piece with the device. So there's a there's just a different level of connection that happens. And I think that's been a really important part for us to, to realize that as much as you may want to go all digital, because it may be more cost effective and scalable, there's just no way you can not have the clinical uh, talent or the clinical connection there with with a human to human. So we we are we've worked that balance out, and I think we're going to continue to do that um, as our digital tools get better, but also as our clinical workflows continue to mature. So, what kind of people do you have that are doing this sort of assistance? Is it like a diabetes nurse educator, or is it more of a technical person, uh, more clinical? So it'll be everything from RNs, diabetes educators, educators to physical therapists. Um, most everyone has a clinical uh, designation and then gets certified on diabetes education. So those are the that's the talent pool that we brought on. We recently uh, last year brought on a chief medical officer because we knew that we were going to get more clinical. So we've added some um, clinical capabilities throughout the business. But the patient engagement are all clinically um, uh, credentialed and then have training around uh, diabetes specifically. Great. So, Tony, it sounds like uh, all the pieces are lined up from the sense that you've got you start with a company that's got an ongoing trust relationship with a large you know, body of, of consumers over a time period. Uh, it's a growing area. There's a lot of unmet needs, misaligned incentives. You've got value based care coming in that should make it work. You've got a concept uh, that should work well. You're scaling up to do it, hiring the your right sort of clinical staff and so on. So who are you who do you present this to? Who are the who are the key kind of initial customers? If you can talk about that, or who, you know who are you going for, and what's the how do you deliver value you know to them and make money for yourself and and make it worthwhile for the customer? Great question. And I, I would say on our medical side of the business, where we're distributing product, it's a fast growing business. Um, we connect with the payers um, and have a broad broad set of relationships. So really really fast growth. I'd say then when you put in our health business our RX business and our analytics, they're scaling, right? Or they're in startup mode. Uh, but we're, 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 we're approaching the payers with this concept. And, and I would say we are getting 
more traction and more conversations, both with lot, the way that the payers contract, you have kind of the, the device contracting or distribution, and then you have the clinical side. So bringing those constituents together of payers and say, hey, look, this is a better way to do this, a better way to drive integrated uh, experience for their members is very critical. Um, and I think we're getting some very, very positive feedback on that integrated solution. The, the businesses also can operate independently and, and they have they have some momentum in, uh, individually, but the integrated platform that we call Living Connected is really where we're seeing a lot of traction. And I think it's because there's a there's we're coming off of COVID and, and the and the focus on digital health platforms singularly. And I think what's happening now is there are hybrid models that are emerging like the ones we have that really focus on enrollment and engagement, which is one of the biggest gaps for pure digital plays. I mean, our enrollment is 60 plus percent on our medical business. Our engagement is 85 percent on reorder. So to have that front end engagement and enrollment makes it a much more organic way to put them on a clinical platform and do coaching and remote patient monitoring. Um, and the relationship touch points also uh, makes it easier to do Rx. Um, so we have that connection platform that really, um, I think, makes this this solution that we put together resonate. So I feel good about where we are. Some of these things are challenging models that are out there historically, uh, but I think the, the time is right to start looking for these new new models that are out there. Well, I agree with you the time being right. I was at a conference in Washington earlier this week where we had the former secretary of the VA, David Shulkin, was leading a session about you know how to live to 100. And the current FDA commissioner, Bob Califf, was talking about uh, how life expectancy is going down. And he commended some articles in the this week's uh, Washington Post. And actually what it shows is that the big reason is, yes, you know, COVID was a big factor by itself. Um, there's violence, there's suicide, there's opioids and so on, which are big, but actually chronic illness overwhelms uh, all of those. And if you look at what's happening, uh, you know, see people may be diagnosed, but they, they don't end up with that on that right path is what you're right. describing. And the only exactly. way that we're actually going to go from being like the worst high income country in, in longevity to being better is actually addressing chronic care. Do you see yourselves as having that kind of vision of being able to, to influence kind of the overall public health? You know what? I'd say uh, thanks for sharing that insight because I, I, I hadn't thought of it in that construct, but but we see that. I, and I'd say yes. So so we've we have focused this platform on diabetes because we call it the core chronic condition in the US, right? So if we can figure out how to do the products, the RX, the coaching, the, the monitoring, and the analytics on diabetes. Um, our ability to do any other chronic condition, especially if it has an anchoring device and consumable like CPAP, um, you can scale this onto any other chronic uh, condition that you want. Because I do think these chronic conditions all have either a device or a consumable that's required to manage the condition. Many of them have RX. And all of them, frankly, require coaching and monitoring. They, the HCPs can't deliver effectively with the bandwidth that they have. So that's the way we built it, because we do believe there's other chronic conditions that need to scale on top of it. Uh, because to, to the point that was made in the conference that you were at, I think chronic conditions are the number one consumer of healthcare and impacting longevity of, of, of life, frankly. So, yes, we do see that as, as a core capability to expand beyond diabetes. Tony, last question I have for you is one I ask all my guests, which is whether you've had time to read any good books lately and anything you might uh, recommend or even anything that you would say uh, it's not worth the time. Yeah. So I, I, I was watching your uh, other podcasts and um, I reflected on it, especially in the, in the context of the conversation we're having. And, you know, I, I always go back to some of the classics, right? You know, some of the uh, Jim Collins books of uh, Built to Last or Good, good to Great, I think, are the ones that I... I go to because they give me kind of what you should be looking for at the end state. But I think the one that's the most compelling to me recently, and I, I read it again right before I uh, took this job, was more around blue ocean strategy. So carving out kind of a new path uh, in a crowded space or developing a new way forward. And, and, I, and, and that one's pretty near and dear to my heart because I think what's going on in healthcare right now and kind of the, evolu the next evolution that we're in kind of stri strikes home to me. So that one's that one's a bit closer to home, but I think strategy ones are always ones I go to because they they kind of make sure you check yourself on 
the greater good or the greater strategy that you're putting together uh, as you put the pieces together. Great. Well, Tony Vahidian, CEO of CCS, I want to say thank you so much for joining me today on the Health Biz Podcast. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.